Okay, um, well, thank you. Uh, I'll just stop my timer. Thank you very much for having me. And um, uh, thanks to, to the, the organizers and all the other speakers. I really enjoyed the talks yesterday. I'm looking forward to the ones this afternoon. Um, I've actually changed my paper kind of at the last minute that the, the abstract on the program is now correct because Raphael changed it very kindly this, this morning, I think, but um, I was going to give a slightly different paper, but kind of I thought this one, having heard the talks yesterday, it seemed to me this one would, would fit more closely. And I've also added a bit at the end, kind of inspired by uh, Asya's very, very interesting talk. So um, we'll see if I, I hope I managed to fit that bit in. But uh, yeah, it's really nice to be here. So some context here is... Um, that the the both talks actually the one I was going to give in this one I kind of drawn from a, a monograph that's coming out in May it's called ontology and oppression race gender and social reality and as of like this week it has a web page so it's I'm very excited I haven't it's my first book so it's you know it's all very all very exciting so the central idea in the book is that individuals can be wronged by the very fact of being constructed as a member of a social kind, a member of a human social kind. Uh, I call this ontic injustice, and that's an idea I developed first in my uh, PhD thesis, which has taken me a very long time to do anything with, and then there's a 2020 paper that, that kind of just has that basic idea. Um, but I take it much further in the book. Uh, I, I add it's kind of sort of beyond that, the particularly severe cases, the wrong involved here can rise to the level of oppression. So it's not just that you're you're wronged, but that wrong is, is far reaching and grievous enough um, that we could call it oppression. And there's a, a strong link here to Robin Dembroff's work on ontological oppression. Um, I define ontic oppression slightly differently from how they define ontological oppression, but in my view, we're kind of pointing towards the same basic phenomenon. And um, I think the fact that we're both pointing at it is additional reason to think that it, it might be uh, interesting to look at. So um, I don't think that that either I or Dembroff is the first to kind of identify this sort of general phenomenon. I think you see this sort of thought in a lot of work on gender and race, for example, in Catherine McKinnon's work on gender and Charles Mills's work on race and in Sally Hasslinger's work on both. But I do want to kind of make a make the case and I, this is what I try and do in the book that explicitly recognizing and theorizing onto oppression helps us to think through some complex questions about those human social kinds that are bound up with oppression such as race and gender so getting clearer on, on what it is and how to theorize it helps us kind of avoid some wrong turns in how we theorize those kinds and shed light on some some issues that are otherwise a bit tricky so as part of doing that um I kind of rely on a, a story that I hope is quite broad church about the ontology of, of human social kinds. So the, the general idea of, of ontic oppression rests on the thought that an individual's membership in a human social kind is at least partly constituted by social constraints and enablements. So I think that there's views you know, out there on which this is very explicit. So if you think of Auster's 2018 conferralist account, um, where social statuses are conferred. I've just realized, I think I left dates out of this slide, apologies for that, um, where social statuses are conferred, properties and a social status consists of constraints and enablements. What it is to have the status is to be constrained and enabled in a characteristic way. Think of something like Searle's um, story about kind of conventional deontic powers that are created by the collective intentional imposition of status functions um, and other institutional accounts as well sort of property cluster accounts, whether homeostatic or otherwise, um, and equilibrium accounts. Now, property cluster accounts and equilibrium accounts, I think are less overtly to do with constraints enablements, but what I want to suggest is that you can still cash them out in those terms. So um, if you're in an equilibrium, for example, certain things are made harder and certain things made easier, and that's what kind of maintains the kind of sweet spot of the equilibrium. So uh, I don't think all accounts of the ontology of human social kinds um, are gonna be, uh, coming under this umbrella. So I think, for example, if you have a structural account, something like Kate Ritchie's view, I think you can cast Ritchie's view out in a way that's about constraints and enablements, but you can cash it out in other ways as well. So I don't, I'm not saying that any account of human social kinds has to kind of give this central role to constraints and enablements, but I think lots of them do or, or can be read as doing so. So I'm trying to be broad church here. I want as many people as possible to be able to use this concept of ontic impression and ontic injustice without being like pinned down to a specific story about the ontology of human social kinds. However, <clears throat> I can't kind of stay completely broad church throughout everything that I want to do, because I also want to actually apply the concept of ontic oppression, especially in the book to race and gender kinds. And to do that, I do need to kind of be a bit more committal. Because 
you can get on board with the idea of ontic oppression provided you just have this very minimal kind of this kind of this very minimal entry condition of thinking that um membership in, in human social kinds is is got you know is partly constituted by constraints and enablements but in order to make claims about whether a particular kind is or is not ontically a site of ontic oppression you need an account of which constraints and enablements um, constitute that kind, right? Because to say that it's oppressive is to say that there's something um, wrong about the constraints and enablements that like make make the kind what it is, that, that the kind of where being under those is what makes you a member of the kind. And so you have to know which ones those are. So you can't stay at this level of generality if you want to make any actual specific claims about um, ontic oppression in particular cases, which I do. So what I thought would happen at that point in the book is I thought that I would kind of pick some existing descriptive accounts of race and gender kinds off the shelf. Um, but it's a really cool literature and there's lots of great views and I just couldn't decide on a view that I uh, liked best. I also have kind of prior pluralist leanings um, that I've, I've sort of kind of come out in some other things I've written. So perhaps not surprisingly, I ended up thinking that kind of maybe a pluralism about race and gender in each case, pluralism about race kinds and pluralism about gender kinds was the way to go. What really got me interested, though, is that in the feminist metaphysics and social ontology and philosophy of race um, and social ontology literature, I found several sort of in principle kind of endorsements or kind of um, friendly noises about pluralism that sort of lacked detail. This is particularly interesting to me in Ron Mallon's book and Alistair's book that were published not super far apart. And in each case, they, 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 they kind of acknowledged, I think, the view of the other um, and sort of said, that sounds interesting. It's not what I'm like, I'm talking about something different, but like maybe they could both be true. Like maybe, maybe they could both be kind of different sorts of accounts or they could be accounts of different sorts of kinds. And that seemed absolutely right to me, but it sort of stopped there and it left me wanting more. So what I set out to do was to develop a systematic framework for being a pluralist about a certain kind of type of human social kinds, say gender kinds or race kinds, I'm going to focus mainly on gender kinds in this talk, that advanced on that, that kind of um, gave more insight. And what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to set out that framework in general and I'm going to apply it to gender kinds. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time to sort of fully substantiate all the things I say about gender kinds. So the thought is that I'm kind of offering you an, an illustration of the framework in general. So if I persuade you to be a pluralist about gender kinds in the way that I sketch, that's great. But please know that I think there's a lot kind of more to be said. And I'm giving you quite a, a whistle stop tour of the, the reasons that guide that, the, the aim being more to model the general framework um, uh, than uh, to um, give a kind of, yeah, cast iron argument for uh, the particular way of thinking about gender kinds that I end up at. And if I have time at the end, I'm going to say something about where amelioration fits into all of this. Uh, that's the new as of this morning bit. So it will be very provisional if it if it makes it in. OK, so uh, I'm going to start by going through a few background commitments um, and I guess flagging where I think I'm being controversial and where I think I'm being um, evasive. So just to really put it all on the table. So the sort of first kind of thing that I assume as a background here is that there are lots of thin kinds, so like a very plenitudinous approach to kinds in a thin sense. Any grouping of things can be a kind in a, in a really undemanding sense. If you don't want to call those kinds and you want to call them something else, that's, that's fine, but I'm going to call them kinds. And then the thought is that only some of those are explanatory, where the explanatory are the ones that figure in successful induction, prediction, explanation, and intervention. I, don't th I think that's hopefully neither particularly vague nor particularly controversial, but the next one I think is more controversial, which is to think that I, I think of ex explanatory kinds as inquiry relative. So kinds and this understanding are explanatory or not explanatory relative to a particular purpose or project rather than having that property kind of in themselves or in abstraction, kind of following work here from Sally Hessinger. This is the vague bit. Um, so I think of social kinds as a subset of explanatory kinds where I, I don't really have, and I'm not super invested in giving a, a particular story about exactly where the borders come. So there's something like the ones that depend on social factors, the ones that are relevant to the social sciences. Um, uh, I think that that's, 
a really interesting question. It's not one that I kind of have a horse horse in that race. Maybe it's a problem for my view that I don't. If you think that, I'd be really interested to, to talk about that, to think about that. But um, that's where I'm at on this at the moment. So give me give, give me the social kinds as a kind of, we kind of know what we're talking about roughly. That's my plea. And then the last bit is just, just for tidiness sake, human social kinds, obviously those social kinds that have human individuals as members. Okay, so that's the starting point. And then the framework that I develop, which very unimaginatively, because I'm, I'm quite bad at titles of all kinds, really, uh, it, I'm calling the Constraints and Enablements Framework. If you're thinking something catchier, um, I'm kind of doing the final correction to the book proofs to like this week. So um, speak up. Uh, but the main claim and the reason for the title is that membership of human social kinds is constituted by constraints and enablements in the sense that what it is for an individual to be a member of a human social, certain human social kind is at least in part for them to fall under certain social constraints and enablements. So what is it for me to be a woman? It's a matter of how I'm socially constrained and enabled. That's the kind of main claim. So in terms of, of, of Brian's, um, I think, very helpful grounding grounding versus anchoring distinction, this is a claim about grounding. This is a claim about um, what, what uh, that, that in virtue of which facts about category membership um, obtain. So I'm leaving open what anchors the kind. So what sets up the grounding conditions? So why do those, why does my being under those constraints and enablements make it the case that I'm um, a member of the kind woman? Here's a piece of speculation. Um, I think on the way I'm thinking about uh, explanation, it might be that our explanatory purposes play a role here alongside whatever it is in the world underpins the regular, relevant regularities. So what sets up the grounding conditions would be a combination of whatever it is in the world that, that supports um, the regularities that underpin the explanatory usefulness of the kind, plus the purposes um, that, from, that kind of give us the perspective from which you know those regularities are interesting. Our explanatory help us with um, prediction, intervention, and so on. Um, that's a speculation, though. Uh, I'd love to chat about it, but um, I'm still still unsure where I stand on that. The main point is that this is about grounding. If you want to use that, I think helpful um, grounding versus anchoring distinction. So building on that, the constraints enablement enablements framework aims to supply some useful tools for theorizing in this area. I'm really looking forward to, to Matty's talk later because I think this is kind of a um, yeah, theory building move. So, so the tools come in two, two flavors. So first there's a taxonomy of the different varieties of constraints and enablements. And secondly, there's an account of how social kinds can be specified on the basis of constraints and enablements. Um, possibly for not, I don't know, I'm being kind of non-committal. If you want to understand that specification in the sense of specifying an essence, I'm really friendly to that. I'm not sure I want to be like necessarily committed to that sort of Freinian framework, but that's definitely one way to, to run this. Okay, so I'm going to go through both of those um, uh, things that the constraints enablements framework supplies uh, in turn and unpack them a bit. So the first thing is the varieties of different constraints and enablements. I think there are four kinds. The first kind is the one that I think is most familiar from the social ontology literature. And this is what I'm gonna call interpersonal constraints and enablements. Constraints and enablements directly based on the interpersonal behavior of individuals in a specific social context. So um, uh, if I'm in a meeting and every time I um, try and speak, I'm like interrupted, uh, by one of my by somebody else in the meeting, then that will be a constraint where I'm, it's harder for me to talk than it is for the other people in the meeting to talk, perhaps. Um, I think that these are the kinds of constraints and enablements that are kind of at front and center in, for example, um, ousters. Auster's conferralist framework. I also would want to include under this umbrella, um, perhaps controversially, I want to include deontic constraints and enablements. So constraints and enablements um, due to kind of that have a kind of like socially normative flavor. So um, being kind of um, obliged to prepare a lecture for my students tomorrow um, or um, something like that. So um, I want to fold those both into the interpersonal category. So the interpersonal category includes constraints, enablements that are kind of just like there's a really ingrained habit that people are going to interrupt me, but they don't think that I'm less, they don't, wouldn't think that I was less entitled to speak, but it works out that way in practice. And the cases where people actually think 
yes, because you're a student, you're not allowed to speak in this particular meeting, you're just here to observe, for example. So it include both. The second one is uh, psychological constraints and enablements. Um, and this is, again, kind of, so it's only in the social domain. So it's constraints and enablements based on the way our kind of socially shaped, socially inculcated attitudes, dispositions, and beliefs affect what we attempt to do. So if I get to the stage where I don't even try and speak in meetings anymore because I'm so used to being talked over, then maybe on a particular occasion, no one actually would have interrupted me or, or maybe I move workplaces, I go to a different workplace and here everyone's going to listen to me um, very respectfully. But I feel so um, unable to take part in that context that I can constrain myself from, from offering, offering a contribution. So that would be an example of a psychological constraint. And I think that these um, are, you know, often theorized in work on like psychological oppression, work by Sandra Barkey. I think you see them in Fanon's work on race and in lots of other places in the race and gender literature. I think they're a very important part of the picture, but they're less talked about, I think, in social ontology. Um, the third one is bodily constraints and enablements. So these are constraints and enablements based on the physical properties of our bodies. Again, the ones that are shaped by social factors. So if I can't lift something that's like, I don't know, an elephant, like I was never going to be able to lift an elephant. But if we live in a society where people of different genders are kind of encouraged to have different relationships with their body and with exercise so that, you know, I don't, you know, uh, like I, I go to the gym and they show me lots of exercises for losing weight, but they don't show me exercises for getting strong arm muscles, then I don't get such strong arm muscles and then I can't can't lift something as heavy as I could have could have perhaps done. That would be a bodily an example of a bodily constraint. <clears throat> environmental constraints and enablements are very similar. They're constraints and enablements based on our physical environment as shaped by social factors. So um, Ronald Sonstrom has done a lot of interesting work on this. Uh, so the idea that maybe it's harder to access green spaces um, because your the physical environment has been kind of shaped along kind of racialized lines, perhaps in the kind of construction of cities, things like redlining um, and things like that, then you would have kind of being less able to access green space would be uh, a constraint that is not just um, a feature of like the shape that the earth had, but is a feature of the built environment. So I want to say that all of these kind of varieties of constraints and enablements, uh, social constraints and enablements can play a role in constituting social kinds in the sense that I, I just sketched. So that I think still leaves a kind of question about like how, so you've got this general idea that there are these, these social kinds where what it is to be a member of a kind is at least in part to be constrained and enabled in a characteristic way. Um, but I think there's a gap between saying that and kind of understanding what it would look like to give a specification, like to specify the essence, for example, of a social kind based on that. And what I suggest is that to, to get there, you have to kind of, specify three things you have to make three kind of um you kind of spell out three things and the first thing you need to spell out is the scope what context are we talking about here are we going to look at the constraints and enablements across someone's whole life in all of the spaces that they kind of move through um, or are we looking for example at a particular context like a particular meeting room so are we asking like, what is it to be say a woman in the UK in the 21st century? Or are we asking like, what is it to be a, a woman in like this meeting room in this workplace or anything in between? So that's scope. The second one is breadth. And this is about the varieties of constraints and enablements we're taking into account. Are we just looking at interpersonal constraints and enablements? And I think many accounts of the ontology of social kinds have taken that kind of um, setting for breadth, if you will. Um, or are we looking at all four or some, some subset of them? And finally, granularity, which is perhaps the kind of less least obvious of them but this is basically about the level of detail we should understand where i'm going to understand the constraints and enablements in because i think that there's lots of different ways to kind of move from the the data points we have about like what actually happens in a situation to sort of theorizing a constraint or an enablement so going back to the kind of meeting example suppose you have a situation in which um, there's a kind of work context and when women try and speak in the meeting they're much more likely than men to be um, interrupted but then you could also break that down further and say well hang on um, 
the, the white women, they tend to get interrupted about 30% of the time. Uh, and the, the women of color, they tend to get interrupted about 70% of the time. So is that one constraint that's shared by all the women or is that two different constraints that the white women are under one constraint and the women of color are under a different one? I think it depends on, on, on how granular, how, how kind of granular you're being and how um, finely or coarsely grained you want to kind of individuate what's going on. So the, the model here, I guess, is a kind of like a sound mixer. So if you, if you think of having like three different dials and you can kind of set them to different kind of settings and the sound you get out will be a function of the kind of combination of settings. And just as with a sound mixer, I think that there are combinations that will kind of produce garbage. So I think that if you want to set the scope really broad, so you're generalizing over a lot of contexts, but then you want to be like super, super granular, I think that that can be a bit tricky. I don't think, I think you might not get very kind of cogent results there. So I'm not saying that for any um, different uh, version like of these settings, you'll get social kinds, but I think if you want to want to kind of specify at the essence of a social kind in this sense, then uh, you need to kind of decide what settings you're, you're going for here. Okay, that's the basic uh, framework, but I guess I uh, I think it may sound a bit kind of abstract, so I wanted to kind of work it through with a particular uh, case, and the case I think is gender. So I'm going to argue or kind of give a provisional argument for thinking that we should be pluralists about gender in that there's um, a number of different social kinds that um, serve different aspects of our explanatory purposes, that none of them kind of serves all of our explanatory purposes. Um, and for each kind, I'll go through and say what the scope and breadth and granularity are. Okay. So the first type, and there's going to be three, three types that I go through. I think there may be more, but these are definitely three that I think are kind of in the mix. So the first type is what I'm calling hegemonic gender kinds. Um, this is uh, something that you see very clearly in Sally Haslanger's uh, ameliorative proposal, proposal for an ameliorative concept of gender, first presented in 2000, where um, S is a woman if and only if S is regularly and for the most part subordinated on the basis of actual or imagined bodily features believed to be evidence of a female's role in biological reproduction. So I think you can cash this out in terms of being very constrained. I think subordination is a matter of constraint. So the idea is that there's these systematic constraints in play and they're very wrongful. I call the, hegemon the hegemonic gender kinds because I think that the, the kind of that's the regularly and for the most part bit like this we're talking about what is the sort of prevailing wind in, in society what is the kind of um, dominant tendency. So I think to, to get to a kind that looks like that within the constraints and enablements framework, you'd wanna set your scope setting very high. We're looking at a kind of global context. It's very, it's very broad, very broad scope. I think it's also, um, you could understand it as taking a very broad focus. So subordination can have to do with um, interpersonal factors, psychological factors, definitely, and also bodily environmental constraints, I think can play a factor too. So I think it makes sense here to say like, yeah, they're all in the mix, all the different four varieties. And finally, I think this is very coarse grained. So the, the um, uh, kinds that Hasslinger kind of the concepts Hasslinger spells out are for things like woman rather than for things like white woman or white cis woman and so on. So that's hegemonic gender kinds. <clears throat> the second is um, what I'm going to call interpersonal gender kinds, and here the kind of paradigm I'm using is Auster's conferralist account of gender, where and indeed social categories in general where genders are these radically context dependent interpersonally conferred kinds. So you, you get the property of being gendered because other people confer it on you and they confer it on you by the way that they treat you in a particular context. And that, that could be kind of different. So for us to this, something different that it is to be a woman, um, maybe in uh, a workplace versus in a bar versus in your home, you would be kind of um, having a different social status conferred on you in each case, and what that status is, it consists of constraints and enablements. And this is a really, really useful notion. I'm gonna call them interpersonal gender kinds. And notice that we get kind of opposite to the Haslinger one, we get a very narrow scope here. So for any given gender kind, we're looking at a really tightly specified context. So we're looking at like a particular workplace, a particular bar, a particular home. It's also a really narrow focus, so um, it only takes into account the interpersonal constraints and enablements, the psychological, the bodily, the environmental, these are out of the picture, Auster thinks they kind of would, 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 would occupy a different place, they don't contribute to making these kinds what they are. Finally, I think the way that Auster spells 
out these kinds as quite coarse grained, but I think in principle you could um, spell them out in a much more complexly intersectional way. And I've sort of said as much in a, in a paper responding to in a book symposium. So the third and final one is what I'm calling gender identity kinds. So this, I guess I'm drawing here on my account of gender as identity, which says that it's about a felt relationship to the social norms concerning gender in one's context. So for me to um, have a female gender identity is for me to mostly kind of experience the norms of femininity as relevant to me. So when they say women should shave their armpits, I feel like that means me and I experience my own hairy armpits in a way that's kind of mediated and structured by this expectation differently to if I was kind of picking up on a um, felt uh, picking up on the, the norms to do with masculinity. There are other accounts of gender identity as well that I think are valuable and useful in different ways. This is kind of using one, this one for the sake of illustration really. Um, so what you get here is you get a fairly wide scope. So the way I define gender identity, it kind of does follow you through, through different contexts, not all different contexts, but it, it, it could change over your life, for example, but it's not like changing as you walk from one room to the next typically. It's also a narrow focus, but a different one from the um, conferralist model. Here, we're only taking into account psychological constraints and enablements. And it's very coarse grained. Um, I now see this as a limitation. I think it'd be better to make it a bit less coarse grained. Okay, so for each of these kinds, I think that there's a lot to be said about the explanatory value that it has. Um, and I think that for kind of feminist purposes, uh, we need to be able to make reference to all three different sorts, at least, and perhaps more as well. So with hegemonic gender kinds, I think they're really useful because they pick up on these kind of far reaching social structures. And that makes sense because oppression is systemic and structural and we're aiming to end it everywhere. So the regularities that they're kind of capturing and bringing to our attention are ones that we need to be intervening on um, in order to, to, to resist gender oppression. As a kind of sidebar, I suspect that given the, the deep imbrication of race and gender with one another in, in social practices, um, we, we, we might find that race, gender, intersectional kinds are gonna be a bit more useful. But broadly speaking, I think hegemonic kinds are useful for that reason. So next up, the interpersonal kinds. I think that these uh, kinds are really useful as well as the, the big broad ones, because if we want to bring about emancipation, I think we need to understand the texture of our own lives differently. And we don't experience the world in that kind of all at once zoomed out kind of bird's eye view way. We experience it kind of through the particular context we move through. And I think interpersonal gender kinds pick up on the kind of currents and tendencies in those contexts. And I think that that's really useful. For example, I think these kinds might play a role in consciousness raising. Finally, gender identity kinds, I think, are useful for a similar reason. So we can't hope to change a pervasive social structure without bringing about changes in the ways that people relate to that structure. So if we want to kind of end gender oppression, we need to live our genders differently. And that's going to have to do with kind of changing the way our gender identities are. And I also think they're particularly important. It's important to be able to make reference to them in kind of understanding and countering the oppression of trans people. So things like avoiding misgendering and its associated harms. So I'm gonna skip this slide because it was some context about the type of pluralism going on. Um, so one of the things I most wanted to do with this framework was to be able to kind of avoid what I think of as the free for all worry. So this is the worry that pluralism is gonna result in this kind of anything goes ontology where productive dis disagreement is impossible. People just talk past each other. You say gender is this, I say gender is that. We're both right, but we don't really know what to do with it. So what I tried to, the way I tried to get around that is to offer a common denominator, which is constraints and enablements, that can kind of mediate between apparently very different accounts of human social kinds, kind of to put them into the same language, even though they might be presented in very different ways. And I think overall the framework enables productive disagreement by supporting us to identify different types of disagreement and also to identify where we're saying something different, but we're not really disagreeing, kind of mere divergence as I think of it. So this is a kind of slightly shonky diagram, but basically the thought would be if we wanted to get clear on um, some kind of disagreement about gender kinds, you say they're this, I say they're that, we'd need to start by figuring out if we have the same explanatory purposes and we both you know, have the same kind of project um, in mind here. And if we don't, we need to figure out whether we have um, a disagreement about that, right? So it might be that you, um, that somebody wants to um, sort of understand um, 
gender kinds in order to kind of shore up a traditional understanding of, of gender in order to kind of like explain the real differences that mean that a kind of traditional uh, pattern of marriage, for example, kind of homemaking and um, breadwinning is like very divided uh, to kind of justify that or to, to um to understand why the, the world kind of supports that sort of way of uh, organizing society. Um, and then we would have a disagreement, not just that we had different purposes, but also that I would want to criticize those purposes on, on normative grounds. On the other hand, we might have, you know, purposes that are completely compatible. You want to explain gender in a way that helps us kind of understand what's going on with oppression in this context. And I want to do it in a way that works for this other context or other type of oppression. So we just have different, um, we have a mere divergence in that case and no disagreement. If we have the same explanatory purposes, we might be agreeing or disagreeing about the empirical facts, like what are the regularities to be explained? What is actually happening? What are we observing in the context? And that would be empirical disagreement if we disagree there. And if we agree on all of that, then we must be disagreeing in terms of our interpretation. We, the, the, the step where you kind of um, specify the social kinds must be where we're coming apart. And that's probably the most philosophically, well, there's a, maybe it's, that's too strong, but there's a lot to go, that would go on there in terms of philosophical disagreement. Okay, so that's, I think that's 30 minutes. Am I good to go for up to 40? Is that right, Raphael? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I can't see you, but um, speak up if, if that's not the case. So I will press on and try and say two more things. So the first one is about the political upshots of this picture. So I think it's um, a, there's a, a, a potential concern and one that I take very seriously about allowing that there are some gender kinds that don't align with people's identities. So what I'm saying is gender isn't one thing, it's many things, it's at least these three things. And some of those seemed pretty nasty. So the, the hegemonic gender kinds, for instance, might be allocating people to um, groups that are based, based on how they're perceived by others because that might determine how they're treated most of the time. Same story um, even more immediately with interpersonal kinds. So in particular, I think it's, um, I think it is the case that on this model, a significant number of trans people in particular, not only trans people, but I think there's a particular reason to notice this, uh, will count as being members of hegemonic and or interpersonal gender kinds for genders which, with, with which they do not identify. So you might have somebody who doesn't identify as a woman, but is being um, uh, interpreted as a woman by other people. And then in a particular context, she would on this model, in fact, be a member of the interpersonal gender kind woman. So background context to this, I think, that makes that particularly urgent is there's a pervasive ideological positioning of trans people as confused and or deceptive, as theorized um, by, by various people. But I think the, the, the source that I particularly go to here is Talia Betcher's 2007 paper, Evil Deceivers and Make Believers. Um, so the worry is that given that background context, allowing in your theory that, that, some, that, that this is the case uh, might be problematic. And it might be particularly worrying in the current political context, which it would be a whole other talk to kind of go into the details of, but I hope you know what I mean if I, if I talk about the, the current kind of, um, I think of it as a kind of trans panic. So I think that's all very important and I take that worry very seriously, and, but I don't think it's a reason to reject the gender pluralist model that I've put forward. And that's because I don't wanna put forward the model, I don't wanna kind of commend the model by itself, I want to commend the model side by side with this idea of ontic oppression that I started with. So if you adopt a pluralist view of gender alongside a concept of ontic oppression, I think it means that we should recognize two things together. First, that gender is many things, not one thing. And second, that some of those things are oppressive and therefore they have no automatic claim to guide our social practices. So if you recognize that social kinds can be wrongful, can be oppressive in and of themselves, then the fact that someone's a member of the kind doesn't give you normative reasons to treat them um, in the way that is kind of associated with that kind. Um, slave is a genuine social kind, I think, but that doesn't follow that anyone should ever be treated as a slave. So instead, I think the, the upshot is that we should be thinking contextually and pragmatically. What gender kinds do we need to refer to in order to further emancipation in a particular context? What gender kinds of the various that exist would be a good basis for organizing our social practices such that people, um, people's kind of well-being and dignity is, um, is upheld? So I think 
that brings me kind of nicely to the final thing that I want to say. So, so, the, so overall, I take this worry seriously. I think it's a very important worry to raise. Um, and because I also have this concept of ontic oppression, I want to say that the pluralis pluralism doesn't point in a problematic political direction or doesn't put us in a position where we don't have tools to oppose um, uh, transphobic um, tran or trans exclusionary uh, um, the advocacy of, of trans exclusionary social practices. It would be worrying if we ended up there, but I don't think we do. Okay, so very finally, and this is a kind of completely new as of this morning, so this is extremely provisional and it's inspired by Asia's talk uh, yesterday. I want to think about how amelioration fits in here. And that this does kind of follow on from what I was saying just now about the kind of thinking contextually and pragmatically about which kinds we need to refer to in order to further emancipation. Oh yeah, so I started off thinking there were two ways. I actually think there's three ways. So there's a typo on the slide. So I think there are three ways that amelioration might fit into the picture here. So one is to say that amelioration comes into the picture right at the start via the inquiry relative understanding of explanatory value. So our purposes, we might kind of understand our explanatory purposes to include particular types of desirable intervention. So you might want to say, we want to understand gender kinds in a way that helps us, like puts us in a good position to intervene on them in ways that resist gender oppression. So this would be the normative or political commitments that guide amelioration will be coming in here right at the beginning in our purposes. And I think if you do that, then what you're doing is you're not only doing a non-ideal social ontology in the sense that, that also explores in her book, um, in that you're kind of attending to the kind of messiness of the social world and you're kind of avoid resisting various forms of simplification, but you're actually doing something that goes a bit further than that, something that is more in the, in the vein of um, emancipatory theory or critical theory. I think I talk about it as emancipatory theory in, in my book, um, but mostly you could also think of in terms of critical theory. And I think that that would lead us to identify, you know, you'd end up being a pluralist then if you end up identifying different kinds that do, sorry, if you take this approach, you're going to identify different kinds that kind of do the explanatory work compared to if you merely wanted to explain and predict observed regularities. So that would be how the ameliorative would depart from the merely descriptive. I think this is a bit different to Asia's picture of amelioration, and I think that's I think, but I hope you'll, you'll say in the Q&A, Asya, I think that's due to a different understanding of explanatory value, where um, I'm taking this more um, uh, inquiry relative understanding. In terms of the puzzle, um, and I'm afraid I don't have time to kind of to recap, but if you were here yesterday for Asya's talk, in terms of this puzzle about how amelioration can also be, you know, ameliorative metaphysics can be understood as um, both kind of doing something, describing the way the world really is, and also having these normative um, and political um, inputs, I think this might fall under the anti-realist brackets. Um, social kinds maybe are not grounded by our subjective beliefs, but they might be anchored by our purposes of inquiry, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure yet. Like I said, this is uh, very new. All right. The second way is to say that amelioration enters the picture later on via the selection of which kinds to spotlight, kind or kinds, once we have a pluralist account on the table. So we could start on this view, we could start our inquiry with much less value laden purposes that don't incorporate normative or political aims. But we then find that there are various kinds that between them do the explanatory work. That would be the kind of descriptive pluralism. And then that's where we bring in our moral and political aims. We consider the pros and cons relative to those aims of kind of shining a spotlight on or picking out one or another kind. Um, it might be that even for ameliorative purposes, we need to pick out multiple kinds. And I, that's a suggestion I've made about gender in the past. I think this is as essentially I understand this as being the solution that that asked the approach that Asya was was advocating, although, of course, I, I defer to Asya on that. Um, and if, if that's right, then I think it solves the puzzle in the same way. You can find the descriptive metaphysical inquiry to some stages of the process and you can find the normative political considerations to others and you're never doing the two at the same time. And I think there's a third way, which is. Um, just to that you could do both. So there's this kind of hybrid way. Um, that you could could bring amelioration into the picture. You could both start out with ameliorative, um, with moral and political aims kind of built into your inquiry, your um, uh, in, like uh, explanatory purposes, your aims, and you could have this inquiry relative understanding of explanatory um, value. And also you could find that 
relative to those aims, you end up with multiple kinds and you need to decide which of those kinds to spotlight. So you might end up thinking, and I think this is kind of where I come down, that um, relative to our explanatory aims, if we're taking a kind of specifically feminist uh, approach there and we're thinking in you know we're, we're bringing normative and political considerations in we're bringing feminist normative and political considerations in I think we end up needing those three types of kind that I outlined the hegemonic the interpersonal and the identity kinds we need them all to do explanatory work but it might be that inter that we should reserve our word gender uh, gender and words like woman and man for one or another of them I think identity kinds are the strongest candidate um, because that's what what works best so I think there's a third way that's why I kind of added it in realized later there's a third way which is that you you bring normative um, considerations in uh, kind of twice over but you can only do that if you're happy or you're, you're okay with this inquiry relative understanding of explanatory value. So if you reject that and you want a more kind of neutral understanding of explanatory value, you can only use amelioration in the second way where it comes on late, not where it comes in early or where it comes in twice the hybrid way. Either way, I do think the constraints and enablements framework can be used. I developed the framework thinking of explanatory value as inquiry relative, but I don't think that's um, integral or necessary to the framework at as such, it's important for what I was trying to do with it, but um, I don't think it's important and it's like necessarily a part of the framework. You could swap in a different understanding of explanatory value and the framework, the rest of the framework would stay just the same. What might well change is the specific account of gender kinds because there the inquiry relative conception of explanatory value was doing significant work. I was talking about kind of what we need to be able to explain or kind of what kind of interventions we need to be able to support to, like consciousness raising, for example, in order to resist oppression. So I think that might change. So um, as a way of being a gender pluralist, I think you do need to get on board with that. But as a, a framework for pluralism about human social kinds in general, I think the constraints and enablements framework can have slightly broader appeal there. OK, uh, that's me. That's me done. Thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. I couldn't fit all the references on a, on a slide. So um, email me if you'd like a list. Thanks so much. So many thanks, uh, Catherine, for your great talk. Um, so there is Brian that has a question. Hi, Catherine, nice to see you. What a, uh, what a wonderful talk. It's so interesting, and I think it's very, very persuasive. Um, <clears throat> so I have a million questions, but one of them, um, the one that I want to kind of focus on is this question about, um, surprisingly enough, about grounding um, and whether these, uh, whether... Um, I hoped you would. Yeah, kind of, I, I wanted, I was a little puzzled about whether you really include the factors in the grounding conditions, and if so, why? Um, and part of it is I think that um, in some of the accounts that you were talking about, um, there are constraints and enablements in the grounding conditions, um, but in others there aren't. Um, and uh, also the explanatory factors clearly don't get included in the grounding conditions, it seems to me. So one of the things that um, it seems like um, the, the worry is that um, if you put more stuff into the grounding conditions, then what you're doing is you're saying, you need to revise the analysis. So, um, you know, the question is, do you disagree with Haslanger's analysis and think that instead there should be additional grounding conditions put in for being a woman on the hegemonic account? Or do you think there should be additional grounding conditions put in for, um, you know, for, you know, for all for your account or for uh, Asta's account? Um, now, if you think about Asta's account, um, there clearly are psychological constraints and enablements as the grounding conditions for um, having for being a member in an Asta gendered kind, um, uh, because if you're treated in a certain being treated in a certain way, it's part of what it is to count um, as one of those local you know members of a local kind. But even in her account, the um, explanatory factors are not going to be part of the grounding conditions. And part of the reason that I, the whole reason for introducing the grounding anchoring distinction is that the um, sources of the grounding conditions um, is that the, the things that you mentioned seem largely like anchors. Um, so that, so let me just stop there. Okay, so the things I mentioned as like the constraints and enablements that I'm wanting to say ground the kinds you think sound more like anchors or at least they're kind of allocated the role of anchors in some of the accounts I take myself to be sort of rewording. Is that the thought? Um, yeah, there are 
sort of, so there are two, as I understand, there are two components of your thoughts. There are explanatory purposes plus facts about constraints and enablements. Yeah. And then there's a, cl a question about where to place those. Yes. Um, and I think that um, in all three of the kinds you talked about, explanatory purposes are not among the grounds. Yes, I agree. I don't think the explanatory purposes are among the grounds. I think the explanatory also, purposes are among the anchors. Good. Also, and I also think that some constraints and enablements are among the grounds in some of the accounts, but not among the grounds in other accounts. Okay, so I definitely want to say that the constraints, the, the, the kind of suggestion I want to make is that the constraints and enablements should be understood as among the grounds. Um, I read the accounts as saying that, but you've obviously read them differently. And I think that there's definitely like, no question. I was kind of looking to slot them into the account. So if you want, if we end up, I think, just settling the detail of the particular accounts probably take longer than we have. And I, I think there are probably other questions. So let me just say that to the extent that it it turns out that if you know on the kind of the best reading or we kind of we talked to Asta and um, she wants to say that the constraints and enablements um, that it doesn't fall the way I think it does with the grounding and anchoring that constraints and enablements um, that it's working differently what I want to say is, is what I said here and in that case I would just say okay this is an account that's close to or inspired by or indebted to the accounts I mentioned but it's not quite the same um, so uh, okay. yes and I guess I would want to then say that the benefits of having the unifying framework are such that you should really consider moving from the original one to my one, because I think it gets you a lot of what was kind of initially kind of attractive about the accounts. Um, uh, but you get to then kind of have this nice way of, of, of being able to be a pluralist in a, in a convenient way. So for reasons of convenience, I would want to kind of advocate that shift. But obviously, I'd need to spell that out and, and make that case in more detail. OK, thanks. Thanks. I hope we can talk more as well. Yeah. Uh, Muhammad Ali, you had a question? Yeah, uh, thanks very much. That was great, very inspiring. Um, I guess I, the question I had is, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, other cases where uh, people want to be sort of ontological pluralists in a particular domain. Uh, take the case of biological species. You know, uh, some people say, look, let a thousand flowers bloom. There's the there's the phylogenetic species concept, there's the ecological species concept, each of them um, try and explain and track different kinds of causal relationships, some diachronic, some synchronic, uh, and so on. And, and by the way, I mean, just as a side note, I, I can't see, I, I can't think of anybody who would deny that ex explanatory value is, is um, inquiry relative. I think of that as being just a sort of a truism. Um, so oh, I'm not sure. You seem to flag that as being a bit controversial at some point. But anyway, I guess the thought that I had is that unlike the case of the biological species and, and some other cases that I can think of, um, there's a sort of interaction between some of these different gender concepts that you, um, that you or different gender kinds that you outline. So for instance, the, the, um, the identity concept, I mean, I think you explicitly said uh, it involves a felt relationship to the social norms, which I interpret as being a kind of uh, interaction with the hegemonic species or the gender concept. And so I guess my question is, what would uh, would that maybe push us into it uh, towards the direction of thinking about a sort of more hybrid gender concept or gender kind that that incorporates elements of all of these uh, kinds that you sketched out, as opposed to um, uh, thinking of them as being entirely disparate. Um, there's this kind of intricate interaction that um, doesn't seem to occur in other places. And I'm, I'm just not sure uh, whether it might be more profitable to think of there being a sort of a composite kind that incorporates uh, these different uh, factors. So I just was wondering what you thought of that. Thanks. Yes. Um, thanks. That's really helpful. And I'm really sympathetic to that. So deaths, there's definitely loads and loads of interaction between the kinds and um, in all sorts of directions, which I won't attempt to, to list. But yes, definitely lots of lots of causal interactions between those kinds. Um, does that push us more into a more hybrid concept? It's, I think that's a really, that question is really interesting to me because part of this came out of Talking to lots of people in um, more uh, kind of the context of like sociology research, for example, about this idea that gender is biopsychosocial. And often when I ask them exactly what they meant by that, the answer didn't seem as precise as I sort of wanted it to be philosophically. 
Um, or it, it, it left me kind of puzzled about how people, it seemed like a good way of maybe understanding the general phenomenon of gender. But if I wanted to understand like membership in gender kinds, it just seemed like different kind of parts of that might give you different results. Like I think, you know, you could be a member of a, one gender in a hegemonic sense, but not in a particular interpersonal context. You're getting kind of situated differently in the context of a particular, um, maybe a resistant community kind of allocates gender on a different basis. And maybe that's good. And then again, your identity is, is could, could be different as well. So it seemed that the, the things didn't always work in step. And that's why I kind of wanted to, um, to, to disentangle it. Now, I'm really friendly to um, the idea that you might want to then say, OK, you can you can have gender kinds like there's a height, there's a hegemonic kind woman and there's a um, uh, interpersonal kind woman in lots of different, many of them in different contexts and and the same for identity. Um, but there's also something that is gender, which is this more hybrid thing. I think I'd be really friendly to that. I don't have a story about, I don't have that final piece to add in, but if somebody wanted to, I'd be really friendly. And I guess the question then is whether it'd still be pluralist. And I'm not sure I particularly mind. I think so long as I still got to operate with the different, um, the different kind of ki different types of kinds, then if you wanted to call that like not, not pluralist, then I don't think I'd um, worry about that too much. One thing that happened recently, just to illustrate the, the framework that, that made me really happy was that somebody got in touch who'd used the, the framework to kind of disentangle different senses in which one could be a mother. Um, and, I, and, and they seemed to find it helpful and I thought their work was really interesting. Um, and uh, I think it was only possible for them to do this detailed where you could be a mother in the identity sense, but not in the interpersonal sense in a particular context because we had that separation. So that's what I don't wanna lose. But adding something else in, that's um, great. And I guess the final thing I'll say is just that I'm tempted to um, add in a kind of a third question alongside the kind of anchoring question, the grounding question, the anchoring question. On my kind of pluralist view, I think you also get something that I'm calling the unification question, which is like, what do all these kinds have in common that they're all gender kinds? And maybe we could have a unified answer to the unification question, but not, um, but still be pluralists about uh about what I've talked about, but sorry, that was a lot. I'll shut up now. Thanks. Uh, Matt, you have, a, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, lovely to see you again. Uh, honey, say hello. I don't know if you can see her. Um, but uh, as you know, very much on board with everything you're saying, you know, go team pluralism, all that business. Um, my question is, why towards the end, we're still concerned about explanatory value for all of our possible purposes here, right? I, I mean, maybe it's the, the the radical in me who's speaking here, but like there are times when I want to ameliorate uh, the metaphysics of gender, the social context, uh, such that, you know, different concepts of gender are operative, different ways of organizing our social space are operative, which have nothing to do with explaining what's going on. I just want to get rid of the injustice or I want to, you know, destroy, you know, patriarchy or whatever. Like it, 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 I'm not interested in explaining anything in that for that purpose. And so explanatory value, I don't care about it. I just want to do the, do, the, do the right thing, as it were. So I wonder if we can be more radical in our pluralism. And maybe Asya, I missed the talk yesterday because I missed yesterday's um, day. Maybe Asya has some response to this, but the thought might be, let's just get rid of explanatory value uh, as like something that all of our purposes need to have for the purposes of amelioration. Cool. So I'll let Asya answer on behalf of her. But for, for my part, I guess I'd want to say that I think what's happening here is that it, I think you're putting your finger on a, a kind of an equivocation or something I'm really unsatisfied with in the presentation. So there may be a better way to do this than, than, than what I did. But I'm kind of thinking of explanatory value as including a lot that's to do with intervention. So supporting that the kinds of dis discriminate, making the kinds of discriminations and distinctions that you need to make in order to intervene in a certain way. And I would in, in think of that as including a lot of what you just talked about. So that when I'm talking about explanatory value, it's I use the word explanatory, but it's about prediction, intervention, explanation and um, induction. So. I would want to see it as folded in, but maybe for that reason and for the reason that you, you for the fact that you raised this question shows that that's a bad uh, framing or I should use a different word. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I'm, I think I'm friendly, friendly to what you're saying, but I hope we can talk more. So we don't have the time for a last question, but let's still have a last question. So Asya. Uh, cool. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine. Yeah, I absolutely love the talk. Um, so I'm wondering um, how pluralist exactly this picture is. So how many kinds do we get in the plurality? 
Um, so you said that the kinds must be explanatory. So I take it that's going to rule out a lot of kinds. Um, and then you have this further thesis that uh, what's explanatory is going to be relative to the inquiry or to our purposes. Um, and so I'm wondering whether your view is that what's in the plurality is itself going to be a relative matter where it's relative to our purposes. And so that would be quite a radical like view of the ontology of social kinds where what social kinds exist is relative to a set of purposes. So, so is that the view? And I, I took it that that was kind of the view that was presupposed in this first sort of amelioration. Yes, that's exactly um, right. But you, you put it better than I did, but that's right, yeah. Okay, awesome. So that's really helpful. So then kind of my follow-up question to that is, it seems to me that one kind of could get off the board on this relativist picture um, by saying that, look, uh, what's explanatory is going to be inquiry relative, but the kinds that exist are just the ones that are explanatory relative to some or other purpose or some or other like legitimate purpose. And so we're not going to have relativism, but we still hold on to this idea that explanatory value is somehow inquiry relative. And I, I took it that when Muhammad Ali was saying that's uncontroversial, um, he was probably thinking that it would be compatible with this sort of view. Yes, good. So I think the, okay, so, so good. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much for putting it so clearly. Um, I think that the, that this is a question that I've just uh, been uncertain about and kind of hedged on and haven't kind of come out with a clear view. I think I'm inclined to think the first way, but I have really anti-realist um, temperaments and intuitions. <laughs> And I know that the second way is like to be more popular. So I think this is just a fudge basically. So let me, I think that's a great question, especially because we're short of time. Let me just say, that I'm gonna take that question away and think about it. I think what's going on, if I'm honest, is what I just said, but that's maybe uh, can be improved upon. Um, so uh, yes, thank you for the question. I think that's, that's a very helpful description of the choice points. I'm not sure which way to jump right now. But I like the idea, I guess, that you could go one way or the other and the apparatus and the distinctions might still be like useful tools. So um, maybe, that's my, then maybe that's my most important hope or aspiration mm -hmm. for the work. Thank you. Right. So many thanks, um, Catherine, and let's go again to a round of applause. And